Hey everybody, welcome to another Rollback, where episodes from the audio only days of the podcast get a second life here on YouTube for the very first time. Rollbacks also serve as a way for me to highlight and resurface the very best of the early days of the show, including today's conversation with a man widely considered to be the most accomplished high altitude climber in the world and one of the most respected adventure athletes of all time. Conrad Anker. Conrad is renowned for specializing in the highest and most technically challenging mountain ascents in the world, conquering the trickiest peaks spread across the high Himalayas, Antarctica, Alaska, and the big walls of Patagonia. He has summited Everest three times, including a successful 2012 ascent without the aid of supplemental oxygen, a feat reserved for only the most elite mountaineers. The impetus for this conversation, which was recorded way back in August of 2015, was the release of a documentary that chronicled Conrad's 2011 attempt to summit a peak previously thought impossible the shark's fin of Meru, which was and is considered the most technically complicated and dangerous peak in the Himalayas. It's truly an astonishing tale. The film aptly named Meru is visceral, it's harrowing, and uh, it's terrifying as much as it is inspiring. Really a must watch if you haven't checked it out yet. And this conversation covers Conrad's truly extraordinary life, and what he's learned throughout all of his incredible adventures. Conrad is a beautiful man, somebody I'm proud to call friend, and I'm excited to share this exchange with all of you. So please hit that subscribe button and enjoy. Good to see you, man. <laughs> it's really great to see you, actually. Uh, this has been a long time in the coming, ever ever, ever since we uh, met up at Summit, and I got to hear you uh, give your give your talk, and we bonded a little bit. I've been wanting to make this day happen, so it took a little while, but I'm really psyched to be sitting with you. Oh, thank you, Rich. It's, uh, I learned more about you from your podcast than you know about me. So. Yeah, I don't know about that. There's, there's, <laughs> plenty of, there's plenty of information out there about you, and uh, I think... Uh, the world at large is uh, on the cusp of learning quite a bit more about you coming in a couple of weeks, yeah, with the release of Meru. Yeah, that will be um, thanks to uh, Jimmy, Renan, and Chai and for making a great movie. Mm -hmm. It really is a great movie. <laughs> yeah, I, wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, I would just have a couple of snapshots and a, a campfire story from it, but they've, uh, they've put it there for many people to enjoy. Yeah, and it's... Um, I would say that it is exceptional on many levels. Um, I think first and foremost, because uh, it has the potential to break through the typical kind of adventure movie genre to touch mainstream audiences, you know, and I think that that was, it's already been sort of pre-vetted in that regard by winning the audience award at Sundance, sort of proving its mettle in terms of having a broad appeal to a wider audience. Um, so I'm interested in kind of exploring uh, why you think, I mean, I have some ideas myself, but why you think this movie perhaps is a little bit different from the average climbing or adventure themed movie. Great. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it, uh, if it goes a bit, a bit bigger, but, um, yeah, there's always, um, there's climbing movies and then there's movies about climbers. And I think this one is about climbers and why we go out there and why we do it. And um, it's a real film. There's no mm -hmm. recreation. Everything that we um, shot on Meru was there. So we didn't go back and, and make something up. And then interwoven into everything is the story of Jimmy and what led up to that point. And then Renan um, and, and then mentorship and friendship and then my personal story interwoven mm -hmm. it. So there's three or four stories that go into it in addition to the, um, the, the story of the Meru climb. Right. And uh, you just mentioned a whole bunch of inflection points that I, that I want to get into. But I think in terms of the film, uh, I mean, certainly 
the the cinematography and the storytelling is exceptional. I mean, I think, you know, from the very first, whoops, spell there, uh, from the very first kind of sequence where it opens up and uh, you guys are, are perched on that portal edge and you can kind of hear the wind and, and you can hear very distinctly like the rippling in the tent and then there's that avalanche. I mean, it's so vivid and harrowing. It really transports you like right to that place and you know, you can almost, you know, I wouldn't say empathize because I think only you guys know exactly what that's like, but for an audience member to get about as close to what that must feel like as possible on film. I mean, it's really, you're gripped from the get-go, but then beyond that, it's, it is, it's a character movie. It's your story. It's the story of your teammates. It's the story of your families. And I think that that provides an entry point, an emotional connection point for the audience to kind of go on this journey with you and relate to it perhaps in a way that um, a more typical kind of climbing movie or adventure movie would allow you to. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. To, it's How many theaters is it going to be rolling out in? It starts on the uh, 14th of August, and it uh, opens in New York, um, Minneapolis, Denver, and Los Angeles. And then the next rollout is uh, a few days later, and then it has a broader. But mm -hmm. each day, um, the, the people at Music Box are... They're adding new theaters to it, so yeah, it's um I this I'm pretty new to it. I've been in the outdoor industry for 30 years, but the big movie stuff is kind of right. not. Uh, I really don't know much about it, and so it um I guess someone related to me that one theater picks it up and then it starts going bigger, and then uh -huh. all of a sudden they all you get a dog pile effect, and so right. well, hopefully that happens, and people in Kansas and and Arkansas are gonna in Tennessee they're gonna want to see something like this. Mm -hmm. So that would be um. That would be the, the best thing because obviously within the circles that we travel and people that are that are into exercise, yeah, they're going to see it. Health, they're 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 already tuned into it, There's, right? But to to break out into that larger audience, I think has uh, there's there's a good potential. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think so for sure. Were you at Sundance when it screened when it premiered? Yeah, we were there at Sundance, and uh -huh. so it was um, it was really touching to. Uh, to see it, uh, this was the first time I'd seen it on, on a large screen, and then mm -hmm. to to be in the back of the audience and to observe the um, how the how they're reacting to it, and they're sitting on the edge of their seat, and they're you can see them gripping their armrest, or mm -hmm. they're going ah like that, or, or some of our little humorous moments in there that they they chuckle at them too, right? And um, and at the end of the day, it's real stuff, and as you pointed out. The opening scene when we were there on the side of the mountain, it, um, we were living that. We were up on the side of that Meru for 12 days on right. that 2011 journey. And so it was like that was the – that look on the face is the – that's what happened up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, better you than me. And I'm man. not a good actor. You know? so I'm always like <laughs> – <laughs> Well, I mean everyone looks really pretty calm, but there's a palpable kind of – um, not foreboding because that's too negative, but like sort of a undercurrent of tension and nervous expectation about what is going, what is to come. Yeah, when you're up there on a on a big wall of that size, and so imagine this thing is probably seven thousand feet of gravity, and so you're in this ocean of gravity, and you drop your sunglasses, they're going to go tumbling down, mm -hmm. and if you don't have a backup, you're going to go snow blind because you're in the Himalayas and the sun's out. If you drop your ropes, you don't have a way to get down. So there's this sense of immediacy and urgency that um, that uh, you have to. It's you and your team that have to. Everything you've prepared for is on the line at mm -hmm. that moment, at that time. And I don't find that in in day to day life. We're just so we're oversubscribed, overstimulated. There's just too much stuff going on, and, and you're driving around and this and that, and nothing's really that immediate or important. And when you're on a climb like that, it's like well, you have a goal of making it to the summit. But if you screw up, gravity doesn't play favorites. It's going to let you know right away that you made a mistake. Right. Uh, certainly anchoring you in the moment in a way that uh, is probably, you know, escapes you in your daily life, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is why I like it is I'm um, 
I'm a, a hyperactive, high strung. I, I, you know, I was a, a bouncing off the wall kid. Right, 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 right. Well, let's let's take it back <laughs> so, and uh, and and set the stage a little bit on you know kind of how you got into all of this. I mean, I know that you <clears throat> you grew up. Your dad was in the service. And your mother was Ger- is German, right? They, yeah. And and they met when he was overseas. But you kind of grew up in a household where backpacking trips were that was the summer vacation, right? So you were introduced to this culture. Uh, at, a, at a fairly young age. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. And my father's side of the family is from Tuolumne County here in mm-hmm. California, and my mother, sister, and brother still live there. And so we would get up into the High Sierra, and we'd go up with mules and fly fishing, and 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> that was what we did. We kind of lived, you know, went up there and ate pancakes, and I would make little mud dams and float twigs down the creek and. We did that every summer for two weeks, and so that was my introduction to it. And then started out peak bagging, and then into roped climbing in my teen years. Mm-hmm. Was, was that something teenager. that you did with your dad, or you just started? You started to kind of take it next level as you matured. He gave me an introduction to it, so it was. Uh, we went rappelling with gold line and around your waist and and the dolphin sits, and I remember uh-huh. getting a rope burn and you know all those things. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to find. I'm going to do more of that. Um, so, Was it something that during those early backpack trips you locked in on and knew kind of from the get-go, like, oh, I have a passion for this that maybe surpasses the, the other people that I'm doing this with? I mean, did or did it happen gradually, like your passion and your love for adventure sport? And- yeah, there was, um, there was this one moment when we'd been out for two weeks and we would – go up in the high country and we'd come back through the high sierra camps and so there are these um, pack animal stocked camps up in the high country and we were coming back in and there was this moment after being out for two weeks and hiking down the trail that it was like wow this is the happiest i am and i was 14 and it was just sort of it wasn't like i needed to be competitive with someone else because it was um it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be a better climber than them. And um, and part of the reason I really got into that is because I was turned off by mm-hmm. competitive sports and the the pressure and the and just sort of the 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 way that children are forced to antagonize other kids and, and and to be competitive and to be better. And so I was like, wow, I'm not into that, but I'm into sports. I'm into physical activity. And so that moment hiking out of the mountains, it I was like, wow, this is it. This is my happy place. Mm-hmm. And so. I was like, whatever work I need to do. So, um, whether this it was is carpentry, it. I, yeah, I'm this gonna, I'm gonna work gonna to live a good quality of life, and, and that was um, I've always stayed true to that. Uh huh. Yeah, and it, it is a very unique sport in that regard. It isn't competitive. Uh, there's certainly teamwork plays into you know plays in in a gigantic way. Um, but it's about your relationship with yourself and your environment. Yeah, and that's for me is the most significant part of it. It was that if you and I go out climbing or we do a long uh, thirty mile run in the middle of nowhere, we're a team. We have to make sure that we're working together and that we're not going to make a mistake. And that and the adversary is the elements. It's the mountain. Mm-hmm. It's gravity. It's the storm. It's the bad rock or something like that. So rather than Say if we're playing tennis where we go back and forth and then the goal is to sort of become a um, – is to, is to beat them and then you hop over the net and you shake your mm-hmm. hand and <laughs> this, this like false modesty and you're like, yeah, but I crushed him. And so you're uh-huh. like – it's um, – <laughs> and I was always um, – it, it just was um, – it was a – it, was, it just wasn't the right way to um, interact with humans. And I think that, um, I mean, part of it, playing football as a kid in middle school, I signed up and I played it and it was just this, um, I liked sports. I had a lot of energy, mm-hmm. a surfeit of energy. I had to put it somewhere. But then I realized that it was just so intense and then you're, I mean, the, the verb of hitting someone. I mean, that's what they call it when you tackle them. Right. You come away from it and it's it's sort of like, wow, it's not a very uh, healthy way to, to have humans interact with other humans. And so I really latched on to scouting and I had a great scout master and he's this 
guy that was a, a Korean War vet, and he was convinced all the youth of today, especially the young men, were turning into a bunch of candy asses, and it was his job mm-hmm. to go out and, and still <laughs> character. So he would do these winter camping trips and all these these great things. Uh, well, he's right about that. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, and I still, uh-huh. uh, I, it's, I, yeah, I want to pass that on to the next generation too. Is you go out and and you try something more challenging, and you come away with a. Um, um, a sense of um, that what you can do and what and, and your ability, but you're also humbled by it. And I think that mm-hmm. that um, that being humble to other to yourself and to other people is a really healthy foundation. And I think probably in the next sort of big meta evolution of, of of human mind of where we're going to be is that we're coming into a more kind and more um, reciprocal, a more loving society rather than something that's antagonistic. I hope so. <laughs> but that being said, I watch the Super Bowl every year. It's not uh-huh. really crazy. <laughs> yeah. You're like, watch this. Well, we live in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're not living in a cave like those amazing sadhus that you pass on the path on your way up to Meru. Oh, you man. Know? How beautiful guys. are those guys? Yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. right? Yeah. And the film where you're we're walking through there and they're just their look in their eyes and the way that they bow and they touch their heart to you and just meeting them. I mean, that is the, every time those, those, um, all three expeditions that I went to Meru to go visit, it was, uh, interacting with the sadhus and Mm -hmm. going and visiting with them, asking them for their blessing before we go and climb on the mountain. And they're like, yeah, Mm-hmm. Tell us what's up there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really special place. They weren't like, oh, you can't go there. It's a bad thing. It's like, wow, you, there's something that's driven. You are, you're a pilgrim and, and you are a seeker. And so they respected that. In Interesting. Us. Yeah. And I, I mean, they're holding a lot of energy, those guys, you know, they're carrying a certain vibration up there, I think. I mean, can you feel that when you interact with those guys? Yeah. They're the, the sadhus and the matajis, the, the, the women that are um, of the holy life, they're... They've renounced material things, and they are um, they live off the benevolence of other people. And so here we are trekking up, going up to 14,000 feet, um, Tabovan, which is the mm-hmm. meadow at the base of Shivling. So we have all these sadhus that worship Shiva, which is a deity in uh, the Hindu religion. And so they, they live there at 14,000 feet, and you'll have these, um, these, these really wise men and uh, an occasional woman that are up there and they're living under a rock with some tarps and and, and, and a cotton sari type mm-hmm. wrap clothing and we're up there with insulated like oh right. yeah now we're the candy asses <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well they're not quite taking it up to the notch that you are but it is interesting what was that ceremony that that you attended that's in the film the um, yeah the start of the, that ceremony is at the in Gangotri which is the jumping off point so it's the end of the road and it's the town of Gangotri and upstream is the source of the Ganges River so mm-hmm. um, the Ganges is the most sacred ri- uh, uh, river for the, the Hindu religion and this valley where Shivling and Bhagirathi and Meru um, is, is steeped in the Hindu mythology yeah I mean that's that's like the vortex. Yeah, so them. you're going in there, and it's like, wow. And Lord Shiva hung out on top of Shivling mm-hmm. for 40,000 years and then right. brought the, the Ganga River down with his hair, and, and then his wife is the, the peak across the way, and then Meru is the center of the universe. And if we think about this, that when Hindu religion came into being, it's probably... Um, three to five thousand years it's a it's a very old religion that when the pilgrims came up and they hiked up into this valley and saw these immense peaks that probably had more ice on them than they do now fording the river was just an incredible thing there was no Mm -hmm. bridges not even Mm -hmm. rope bridges i mean it'd have to go on one side of the mountain it was a real challenge to get there and they finally got up and they looked at these peaks and they were just going all the way up to the sky. And um, I mean, now we're, before we're even born, we know that jets exist and airplanes and you can have a building this tall as the Empire State Building, all these things. So, but without knowing that, if you were a, you lived out in the plains of India and a seeker came and told you that there was a mountain that went to the, to the top of the world and that was it. So 
that right. Meru, and then seeing that peak and then having that come out and being a spreading all the way as far as uh, Myanmar, where they have um, in, in Indochina, where the, the there is a, a temple of Meru there that's um, part of Angkor Wat. So it's just kind of how that that reach of it and everything like that. So it's um, a pretty um, to there's many mountains in 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 the world, but there there this having that 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 sense of uh, connection to the culture was pretty special. Yeah, that's cool. It has a whole, you know, history in that culture that I was not aware of. That's amazing. Very cool. So taking it back to you as this, I mean, you've, you were, you've sort of self-described yourself as a hyperactive kid, right? I mean, do you think <clears throat> that if you were growing up now, like you probably would have been medicated, right? <laughs> like, let's calm this guy down. Let's, you know, get him to fit in the box as opposed to, you know, you were lucky enough, fortunate enough to have, you know, a loving family that said, well, we got this kid, like we got to figure out a way to get him to channel this energy that he has in a productive way. Yeah. Right. And you were supported in that. Yeah. And I think it, in the 60s, they were medicating children in, in, at my age. And mm -hmm. that was my mother, um, particularly my mother and my father too, but my mother was, she was the one that put her foot down. She said, no. And she still at this date doesn't like to go to the hospital or doctors or medications or anything like that. And, mm -hmm. and I'm that way too. I'm averse to it. I'd rather, I just don't, I don't have a, a need for it. And so they, she said no. And she simply attributed it to, okay, he's got too much sugar and there's <laughs> not enough physical <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was like, okay, Let's just burn him out every day. Yeah, more exercise and less sugar. And that was her remedy for it. And I think it was, um, it really made sense uh -huh. and, and to, to see that. And It'd be great to when we have children now, especially um, young boys. And when I visit um, classrooms and stuff. Now there's a weird buzzing noise. Hold on, let me just yeah. pause it for a second. Starting up again. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. We had a weird buzzing noise. Had a little time out. So where were we? We were talking about medicating children and this um, this sort of level of um, where we're at. And so I enjoy uh, talking to children about science, fourth and fifth graders, giving them going to classrooms. And I see these these children, a lot of them young boys that are just bouncing up the wall. They're hyperactive and there's all this energy in them. And um, rather than trying to say, okay, we're going to solve this with Ritalin or something like that or some sort of medication, what can we do to, to encourage these and work it to their benefit? And mm -hmm. I think that's, I was just as a kid, I was hyperactive, high strung. I can look back at my report cards from second and third grade. He couldn't sit still. He couldn't hold his attention for uh -huh. 10 minutes. He's a bright kid, but we just don't know we what don't to, know do. to do with him. Right. I'm like, ah. <laughs> so, and I think to this, where I am now, I am a very hyper situationally aware person. I mean, both you and I are. We heard the buzz in this microphone right away. Right. Okay. We're going to too distracting. That like I had to stop. <laughs> yeah. And so, if I'm driving down the road, yeah. I'm. I'm like, okay, this is the this is LA. It's four four lanes wide of traffic, and everyone's going 70. And there's a a scrap hauler up there. Is this load secure? If there was to be a piece of metal that came off, what would I do? Mm -hmm. Or if I'm climbing, if I don't protect the second, put a piece of gear in there, there could be a p potential mistake. So I'm thinking about a worst case scenario, and then planning about it in reverse. And so, if you have that hyper situational awareness, you will you make for to be a good pilot, mm -hmm. um, a good climber um, you want someone that really takes in all that all that data point and in a classroom as a young kid it was absolute craziness because I try to attend to them all and I still when I sit down to my computer if I don't have a, a list of the emails I need to do and how I'm going to structure my time I just totally yeah <laughs> I would imagine that I'm that going everywhere <laughs> if you were yeah if you lived in New York City you just you'd be in a constant state of freak out right like because there's too much stimuli right but when you're when you're on the mountain, um, you can channel all of that hypervigilance onto the one task at hand because there's really just one thing you got to do at a time. You're aware of all the variables, but it's like, what's the next thing? Like, you're I'm just climbing. on a mission and you're doing one thing. Yeah, right? and that's what brings it into me. So, and climbing gyms provide that. And then I can, I, I'm that play with gravity where you're where you're there and you step off the ground and you're pulling on the holds. And when you're outdoors rock climbing, that's that thing. And so, the expeditions are sort of the culmination of all those experiences mm -hmm. under one grand journey. When you think of, 
uh, you, you look back on your career as a, as a climber, you know, I would imagine that this, you know, hypersensitivity, you would reflect on that as being part of your success equation, right? But like, what do you think it is about you specifically that distinguishes you from your peers or that's allowed you to kind of be in this, you know, pardon the pun, like rarefied air in terms of the world of climbers? I, in, I I enjoy it every day, I yeah. guess. I mean, so there's always that sense of... But they um, all enjoy it. Yeah. But... I'm going mean, ma- to make you step out of your yeah. sense of modesty here <laughs> for a minute. Oh. Um, I've got good distal circulation, so my hands stay warm in cold uh-huh. places. So there's sort of... Um, and then having done enough trips to the altitude, I've um, my lungs do well, and maybe I've self-selected to, to climb at altitude. That's another thing on that. But... Um, I, that sense of um, just being on the edge and being in a really remote place is incredible. And mm-hmm. I remember as a kid, I would set up like pillow forts and I would pretend I was in a, ki- in a tent in Antarctica. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it would be like... Really? There was nothing else out there. And that was like, it would just be like, make wind sounds. And it would just, it was, you know, I'd... I transport myself out of there and those kid imaginations are always so rich and vivid. And, right. And so, so it's almost like you came out of the womb like this, almost like you're channeling some past life experience, you know, <laughs> like this was, yeah. this was bred into your imagination from as far back as you can remember. Yeah. And I think for certain individuals, they're hardwired in their DNA to go explore and to have, to have a higher risk acceptance level and those have always been the explorers you go back Mm -hmm. in the course of history and in the great books homer's odyssey is about that where a few people would go out and leave the comfort of the tribe or the clan and then seek something and with a, a reward if they come back safely and successfully but then also the risk of failure and and not coming back being part of it and some people that's still there and it's still part of who they are. I mean, why do some people end up being astronauts? Because they're the confines of nine to five are not there and Mm -hmm. they would rather do that than um, have some other path in life that wouldn't be as, as risk and and with as much exploration. Right. I mean, I think it brings up uh, a really interesting kind of point about our culture. I mean, we're, you know, our whole society is, is sort of founded upon, this idea of, you know, security and having the good life and trying to create, you know, extra ease in our day-to-day <laughs> existence. Uh, you know, at the same time, we herald the heroes, we herald the risk takers, you know, we love to enjoy those stories. But the message that we're getting is really not so much to pursue that. It's like, oh, you know, the life of moderation is best. And, you know, you'd be best served by having this big screen TV or getting a nicer car or a nicer house. Um, and so I'm always thinking about like how to reconcile those two worlds. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, you know, a big part of your message is to go outside and explore. Right. And at the same time, you know, we're telling school children, you know, we're putting helmets on them the minute they walk outside the house because we're a fear-based culture. So, you know, how does that play into, um, how you communicate, you know, to the world and to young people, because I know you talk to young people quite a bit. Yeah. Um, people, we are so conditioned, and, and the media is a big part of it. They want us to buy a bigger house, a mm-hmm. more comfortable car, more food, more, and they, don't, they want us to be less, uh, take on less risk. They want us to be consuming members of society, which means you're productive and you have a job and you can afford more things. And status is accorded with fancier cars and all this and, and, and any sort of these material measures of life that are there. And 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 we relate it to the children. We have it at, at a very young age. And on my part, that there's people that they're like, send me letters. And they're like, you're irresponsible. You can't be a parent. Alex already tied climbing and come on, you're doing this to the kids again and you're just incredibly selfish. It's the wrong thing to do and get a life, grow up, all these things. And Mm -hmm. so I'm one, I don't like to pass judgment on other people and I accept everyone is good and, and and I won't say, okay, that's fine. That's that's your point of view. But we, 
we have this, we have to constantly be growth in our society is like, we need to, we need 4% annually. We're, we need to catch up with China. They're growing faster than we are. We're doing, and so this growth versus quality is, is a thing. So it's that quantity versus quality of life type thing. And so rather than every time I go shopping for something that isn't essential, i.e. it's not food, I, I hold it and I go, do I really need this Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And am I just getting it because it's a newer one and that there's a there's like the shopping crave, that that urge, that that reward or and I deserve it. I've earned it or I, I mean life is hard. I should treat myself mm -hmm. to these really nice headphones. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, yeah. And, and it, so there's like that there's that um and then a push and pull. Yeah, and yet I go over to the time I spend in Nepal and the Nepali people are some of the, the happiest people. Like we go into these villages and they're like, they, they're really happy people. And they mm -hmm. want to, um, they're, I mean, and yes, there are many people that are happy in the United States, but oftentimes there's people that, in, that you interact in a public space and they're just, they're not, they're some, something's wearing at them. And they just, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're walking around with, this weight of unhappiness and sometimes I want to say hello guess what life is really short you can't go through thinking like this yeah yeah <laughs> and, yeah and so you see these people these, these sadhus in India the, the monks in, in, in Tibet and, and so they're living in the moment and they're, they're they realize life success in life isn't equated to material acquisition mm -hmm. what else about that culture do you think informs their happiness quotient in Nepal, they're a very resourceful people. I mean, yeah, certainly there's unhappiness, there's tragedy, and there's things that happen. But um, there's certainly recently, yeah, and they, um, but yeah, they uh, they they send they they tend to be um, there's they're it's simple. Yeah, I, right. I, I and I'm struggling for words because I really don't know what it is, and mm -hmm. I guess I'm still trying to answer that. And when I go over there, and and so. Yeah, a lot of them do want to have um, a new pair of jeans and a better cell phone and things like that. And it's easy for us, having all these these things that make life comfortable and life easy, to say, oh, isn't it, wouldn't it be great to just go sit on the side of the mountain in a cave? But um, there, uh, I think part of it is that there's, um, there's, in Nepal, it's a pedestrian society, so people are walking. And when you walk on the trail, you interact with everyone. You, you, you see them in their eye, or if it's a friend or something like that, you say hello. And when you're walking with a friend from Nepal, and, and they see, you see how they interact with their people, it's way different than we're driving in a, in a car, in a mm -hmm. bus, or something like that, where it's you don't have that, that sort of connection. Families are very connected and very tight um, with it, so maybe that has a... An, an underlying uh, part of it, and um, that uh, there's this. For most of Nepal, is is pretty rural. I mean, Kathmandu is is a teeming metropolis, to an overcrowded, polluted Southeast Asian city, and like Jakarta and Bangkok, and I mean, it's the world is full of those places. But the people, when you get out into the the sticks, they're. Um, I mean, there's roosters and there's a simple life and mm -hmm. so there's uh <laughs> there's some happiness there yeah well i think it's um it's sort of like uh the blue zones have you you heard of the yeah, blue zones Dan's yeah so yeah. dan yeah i've had dan on the podcast and um you know a big part of it you know from his exploration into this question is is that communal aspect of having an extended family close and and being close with your neighbors and you know and the walking and all of that i think informs all of that so yeah. much to be learned right yeah there's it's nice to see that and it's nice to see dan and his work looking at, at data driven so mm -hmm. not just oh we're, yeah it's not just observational what I think it is. Yeah. right yeah 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 because yeah. you're always observational and then you end up extrapolating your own views so if it works for me then it's got to work for someone else right and so having that that those those data points is, is really an important thing is now as we have more data, we can then work through those things and, and find out these cultures in, in Japan and, and other places that, that have a long life and what are they, what's part of that. Right. So, 
All right. So you're locking into climbing as a young person. When does it become like, when are you taking the leap into, you know, all right, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is my profession. And I know that like, you know, (laughs) the, the line into becoming a professional climber, you know, isn't exactly like, you know, LeBron James entering the NBA, but you know, at some point this becomes basically all that you're doing. And, you know, what was the first big expedition for you? In, I was 23, and I received a grant from the American Alpine Club to go to Alaska. And so, yeah, there was four of us, and we got $400, $100 mm-hmm. each. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Party down. Yeah. 1987, we were living big. And so we, um, we, got, we drove a, a blue, a spray-painted blue Ford Econo line from Salt Lake up to Alaska. And I love it. Climbed in the Alaska range and had this great time. And so that was, um, I think that was, it was a grant from the American Alpine Club. So it was sort of a something going on with that. But it wasn't, um, I continued to climb full-time. So I would work, after I graduated from the University of Utah, I would work carpentry. And mm-hmm. it was, um, I enjoyed that work. And then it was, I mean, at the end of the day, I would... My my job was done, and then I would work really hard for four or five months, and I would go on a on a trip. So um, carpentry, high scaling work, where you're working on rope access, cliffs, and buildings, and things like that, and mm-hmm. then working hard, and then going climbing, and that was how I got my start. And then um, starting in '92, um, working with the North Face, and right? So they're, and you've been like with finish. them ever since. I mean, that's been an amazing relationship. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And um, yeah, I started with them in '83 uh, at, at, at my retail work, so selling. And there was a Holly Bar gear shop, and there were the old Roy Holly Bar. It was a sew your own down jacket. The kids, mm-hmm. <laughs> they sold carabiners and. So that was my college job. I enjoyed that. And um, so, and then 92 working and helping with sports marketing to create the story the brand uses now. Right. And what is your, what's your role with them today? I mean, I know you're, you're sort of the athlete team captain, right? Is that correct? Like, yeah. What, how does that work? <laughs> I mean, I know they have uh, like these summits where all the North Face athletes get together and uh, from all disciplines, all different kinds of sports. Yeah. Um, and you guys share stories and all that kind of stuff. Like I'm super jealous. Like I want to know what that's like and kind of, you know, peek into the world of the North Face athlete team. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I, yeah, on paper, it's uh, athlete team captain, but probably maybe uh, brand compass over the years. Mm-hmm. So working with our uh, marketing uh, team and our strategic partnerships, corporate social responsibility, um, film projects, things like that. And having this sort of what is legitimate climbing, what's not climbing, what's good, what's not. And then um, with our athlete team, we have three areas, action, uh, performance, and outdoor. And so action is snowboarding, skiing, free skiing, things like that. Mm-hmm. Performance is predominantly trail running and outdoor is climbing and ski mountaineering. And so probably globally um, about 40 athletes that mm-hmm. we have. And um, so um, recruitment and development of the athlete team, which is I really enjoy doing um, and meeting the uh, prospective athletes. And with what we do is um, if you, we see in Bolt, you run the 100 meters, you win It's a quantitative win. We get that. But what we're doing is experiential. And when you go out in the mountains, whether you're in Shackleton's time or Lewis and Clark's time, you experience it and you come back and you share it. You would write Mm -hmm. about it um, in those guys. And in Shackleton, they had still cameras that came along and using these as examples. And so that experiential part of it is is key to what we do. So in finding uh, athletes that are good at what they do um, and that have um, an ability to share their story with people that are um, that are nice affable people mm-hmm. they're charismatic they're intelligent and all these sort of these great things that that we do so and it's been um, um, uh, a, a great part of of doing that and then fostering sort of a team and then right. cross pollinating between the various disciplines and um being able to work with our um, the the product development team and the sales team to get what we hope the athletes can then do for the brand and then sharing them and helping them to go with that. And right. So it's nothing. I mean, all the big brands use athletes to 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 
whether you're selling golf clubs or baseballs or anything like that, and we're um, selling outdoor gear. And so there's, um, it's been a great journey. I really enjoy the brand. They've trusted uh, with me what we're doing. And then also now as we're um, um, trying to get more people outdoors and, and more people healthier, and, and they're like these ideas that we're going to touch on here in a little bit, they're like, here's the runway, go with that and, and find out the people that you can work with and what are we going to do to, to get this to mm-hmm. get this going because they're like, yeah, sure, we want to sell more raincoats, sleeping bags and tents, but at the end of the day, if we get, if we, the, the BMI of America is, is less and we're healthier and all these key right. metrics are lower, then we've done a good thing and that's, um, you can look at it from any prism. You can look at it from the, the prism of I'm an American, it's the patriotic thing to do, or you can look at the prism that I tend to look at things, that it's the right thing. It's this next um, growth in terms of kindness and understanding of, of humans and, mm-hmm. and, and that this fundamental experience of being outdoors is at, is at the foundation of that. Right, yeah. Well, it's, it's, you've, you've done a great job, and the brand's done a great job because the, the content that gets put out is always of a super high quality and the storytelling is always extraordinary. And it's not really, you know, they're not ads, you know, it's like, yeah, you'll see like, oh, this is the North Face, you know, presents or something like that. But then it's really just about whatever adventure is being told in that in that film. So they're always really cool. You know, it's the, one the that, team over there that does that. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. But it's cool. And I've had a couple of the the runner guys, I had Timothy Olson on the podcast and I've had Dean Karnazes on too. And those guys are both, you know, they're in a, I mean, Dean's different because he's more, more, it's more like lifestyle with his running now, you know, Timothy is still competing, but he's such a charismatic, beautiful guy. And he has such a, a an adept way of like sharing his experience of the world. So I think it's a good fit with you guys, which is cool. <clears throat> so, all right, so when did the big, you know, like you've climbed Everest three times, you know, the big sort of things that have put you on the map, when does that start to begin? Probably in the mid-90s. So mm-hmm. um, there's um, probably most climbers have sort of a, a two-decade window of, of their, when they're at their, their mm-hmm. peak and their prime. And so starting in the 90s, was that was... Um, uh, trips and '96 did an expedition to um, Antarctica with National Geographic. Mm-hmm. It was with Alex Lowe and um, Rick Ridgway and Gordon Wiltsey, Mike Graber, and John Krakauer, and we climbed a this granite tower in the middle of the ice cap. And so that was mm-hmm. a, a, a fun expedition and, and sort of a a break going a little bit bigger. And then on the First of May, 1999, on an expedition to the north side of Everest, I came across the frozen, well-preserved body of George Mallory, and then right. so that was, for better or worse, I mean, it went around the world. And it was just in the, the nascent age of the internet and internet reporting, and, and sort of the um, mountain zone was the the conduit that all that information went out from. So it was um, some people thought it was a great thing; other people, it was. Uh, I was I was vilified and understandably they have different well on. yeah I mean from what I understand I mean for better or worse that kind of put you in the, on the map in certain ways and overshadowed some of the other things that you've done I mean it, it is an amazing thing to discover his body um, it was more in the I mean you didn't really have anything to do with how the photographs got disseminated right they just sort of leaked out and then that sort of cast a shadow on how the story was being told is that fair yeah to say? there's um, yeah, the, the photos went through a... Uh, so the family got upset. Yeah, through an agency, and then the agency um, um, went to the highest bidder, and it was the tabloid press. So that was mm-hmm. um, something as, as important as this, there was, um, and, and significant, it would have been, um, and that's, it's... it's many years back and neither here or there. Right. So, so, but just explain who George Mallory was. I mean, he attempted this Everest climb in 1924, a very yeah. different age in climbing. Yeah. George Mallory was the the one uh, English climber that was part of all three of the early Everest expeditions. So he was there 21, 22, and 24. And uh, 21, they figured out how to get to the North Pole via the Northeast Fork of the Rungbuk Glacier. I mean, this is an area that was unmapped. It was mm-hmm. blank. They had to walk all the way in over um, from 
Darjeeling up over the Julep La through Shigatse. I mean, just an incredible journey on foot with, with pack animals to get to the base. Came back in 1922. They were a little late in getting there. Um, and a monsoon avalanche came in and swept away seven of the Sherpas that were climbing with them. And they, the expedition turned back in the face of that, that loss. Um, mm-hmm. They took 23 off um, because it was um, they needed more time to organize and to get prepared. And then they came back in 24 early enough to beat the monsoon, which usually sets in around the 1st of June and lasts until the 1st of September. And that's when the majority of the moisture comes onto the Himalayas, especially at mm-hmm. altitude. And they gave it a go, and it was on the 8th of June that um, they disappeared into the clouds around noon local time, um, last seen by Noel O'Dell, a geologist the day behind them in support, and he had commented that they were moving expeditiously as if to make up for lost time. Mm. Subsequently, the question always became, could they have made it to the top 29 years before Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay did in 1953? No one ever knew. Um, no one, we, it's generally accepted they didn't make it to the top, that they lost their lives somewhere um, in between the first step and the yellow band, or maybe moving up towards the second step, but not above the second step. Mm-hmm. And these are cliff features on the northeast ridge of Mount Everest. So, um, but he was um, a, a great character. He um, had served in the um, the First World War, the Battle of uh, Ypres, and so he'd seen the loss of life in combat and and sort of that that harsh end of things. But he was also passionate about climbing mm-hmm. and the arts and letters. He was a school teacher, and um, his wife um, had uh, given him a uh, blessing to go on this expedition, and um, yeah, he disappeared in, on June 8th, left behind three children. Um, Claire was still alive um, in 1999 when we made the discovery, and his son John is still alive, living in South Africa, and his grandson George mm-hmm. is in Australia. So there's and, and a connection with their family. Part of the intention of your expedition was to retrace these steps and, and perhaps solve this mystery, right? Yeah. Could they have overcome this the second step, this cliff mm-hmm. band up at uh, 28,300 feet? Right. And as you're, you're making your way up, you kind of diverged off the path that you were headed on, right? And then something caught your eye. Yeah, we had set out to look for George Mallory's body. That was, we were very clear about that. It was the Mallory and Irvine research expedition. It Mm -hmm. was uh, funded by PBS and BBC, ZDF in Germany, and NHK. So most of the, those four countries, their national, uh, their public television expedition organized and led by Eric Simonson. So our goal was specifically to look for the body of George Mallory. I wasn't specifically a searcher i was more on the um to go have a go at the second step to have mm-hmm. to see how difficult that cliff band was mm-hmm. and um that was uh so we went on to a traversing uh contouring around at uh 8300 meters i, had, I hadn't been to that elevation before and um in looking on the features of the mountain where um where when people fall on big mountains um not a cliff where you kind of it's like a wily e. coyote anvil coming off the edge of a right. boom at the bottom, and then the rotor gets up and runs away. But um, this, you tumble down. You tumble, yeah. And you end up in certain places in eddies, just like you do in the rivers, where a, a, a stick might come in behind a rock, something like that. And so there were certain places on the mountain that I realized that there was a good chance there would a body would be there. And then it was a very dry year in 1999, mm-hmm. and. Um, a very humbling moment to come across um, his body 75 years after he had um, passed away. And, uh, yeah. And so what did, what did, how did you deal with that discovery? I mean, did everybody come together and... We, we came together and we, um, we, you know, from a very quasi-scientific point, we performed high-altitude archaeology. I wish I had had more archaeological mm-hmm. training going into it. I would have... Um, treated the site vastly different in terms of measuring it in quadrants and, and um, I mean, that was a... But you're also at 24,000 feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, sort of now. Yeah. 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 Out of air up there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we um, brought back some of his personal effects and they were returned to the family. Um, 
and uh, performed a committal service, um, read the 103rd Psalm, and did what we could to bury his mm-hmm. body there at that moment um, and, and sort of uh, bring circle to his uh, life. Right. And based on your observation and your rudimentary archaeological skills, I mean, were you able to make a reasonable conclusion about whether he had summoned it or not? The best of, um, I, yeah, the, the best of my, uh, my understanding on it would be, this would be their summit day. They left June 8th. They were a little late leaving mm-hmm. camp. They didn't leave. Nowadays, climbers leave at as early as 9 p.m. the night before, or we left at that time at about 1 in the morning and climbed through the night. But when Odell had got to their camp, their flashlights were still in the tent. So they'd left the tent without taking their flashlights. And these were flashlights that were, they weren't headlamps, they weren't mm-hmm. these fancy things, and batteries were, I mean, they'd hauled these batteries on a ship through the Suez Canal mm-hmm. all the way around, and, I mean, just gone for the longest well, Not to didn't. mention all the champagne, too, right? Yeah, the champagne, the foie gras, and all <laughs> yeah. that stuff. So they finally get all this stuff there, and they left their, their flashlights in the tent, they headed out, and they climbed up through the, um, the yellow band, which is pretty tricky terrain. It's the steepest section on the north to Northeast Ridge at that point, the route that Mallory had pioneered. And they got above that and they traversed over probably to the base of the first step. And it was in that vicinity that Odell had last seen them as the clouds Mm -hmm. built up in the afternoon, which is typical pre-monsoon accumulation of clouds, the condensation that they they build and then they dissipate in the evening as the clouds, uh, as the temperature drops. And they had turned around, were coming back down and one of the two of them had slipped descending the yellow band, which is, it's not outward facing, you're just marching downhill, you have to turn inside and climb. And they weren't using protection as we now use it, which is to mm-hmm. put in a either a piton, which was the first type of protection, or a stopper, or a spring-loaded camming device, all three of those things. You can then put them in, the, in a cliff, and then you can uh, attach a carabiner, and then you clip your rope through there. And this is the technique that climbers use that came from sailing, so the original, the belay, the bollard, carabiners, all these things came from sailing. So there was someone that cross-pollinated between sailing and climbing and using those techniques, but Mm -hmm. they were not using those techniques in 1924. So they were probably down soloing. So each person, they have a rope between them, and the rope has about as much security as, say, as when you're in the subway and it's rocking along and you grab the Mm -hmm. the the, the, the little hand, handle hanging yeah, from the Yeah, it'll keep ceiling. you from toppling over, but you're not putting 100% of your weight on there. Right. So if someone were to slip, you could grab that rope real quick and keep them from tumbling down. But it's not in the sense that, that say, on the Meru film, where you see that, that I mean, it's very elaborate. We're using ropes and for upward progress, and then we rappel down on them, and how we use the, the modern climbing protection and equalizing them. And it's very much a different sport than it was mm-hmm. in 1924. So one of them slipped, pulled the other one off, and the rope snapped. Um, Mallory fell down and had a compound fracture of his right leg. And um, my guess is that he was still uh, cognizant at those last moments of mm-hmm. his life because um, – his body is is resting uphill most of the time when you're unconscious because we're top heavy we end up with our heads downhill and so mm-hmm. when you uh, see someone that's had a bad fall they end up bought head downhill and that right. um, and so in this case his head was uphill and it seemed like he'd crossed his like I mean he could have been moved by another climber in subsequent years but um, he probably for a moment or two he thought that he could uh, that rescue someone would come help him out but um mm-hmm. life left him and then he there he was there he was yeah well in your occupation uh i would imagine uh coming upon a dead body is part of uh what happens we especially on, on a mountain like everest mm-hmm. there's um you get up above 26,000 feet 8,000 meters and you're on borrowed time i mean the human body We have not evolved to survive there. We use tools to to get through there, insulative tools, crampons, and supplemental oxygen along those lines. But if you are a climber, you have to make peace with death. You have to understand that that you could die. And then when you see a body in the mountains, um, it's a little bit shocking initially when you see that body. But then um, you... um, you accept it, and I guess in that sense, I 
I think that we've sort of taken mortality and, and morbidity and we've made it into a carnival type thing. You look at all the movies now and there'll be people get killed 20 times in the movie and we're just sort mm -hmm. of, it's like, well, it just happens. They got shot five times. You turn on the TV and there's like boom, boom, boom. And if you think back 200 years, um, there wasn't that, there might be a spy novel where, oh, he shot them. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, it's yeah. a weird thing because, yeah, on television or in movies, it's you're constantly bombarded with images of death. But in our daily lives, we walk around really not giving it its proper due. And we all sort of think that we're somehow going to be the exception to the rule or, yeah. you know, we defer thinking about it and try to deny its inevitability <clears throat> in our life. Uh, but with what you do, it's, it's ever present, right? Yeah. It must, it's in the forefront of your consciousness, I would imagine, in a way that it isn't for most people. And it's a, I think it's a good thing. You know? yeah. I mean, it, you look at how we treat our elderly rather than trying to embrace them. And, and you know, maybe it's one of these things in, in Dan's book about how you live with your elderly and you're mm -hmm. there with them rather than saying, okay, they're a burden to us. Let's move them to the rest home. And then they go into the hospital. And when they finally expire, there's not that, um, maybe they might be surrounded by friends and family or something like that, but it's, um, we're just not um, there in that. Yeah, and that full, and our whole industry is is about you have to be younger, healthier, fitter, happier. Mm -hmm. um, go to the plastic surgeon. Go do this, and it's um, I think accepting where you are in your stage of life, and that the foundation of that is today is the best day of your life, and mm -hmm. tomorrow is going to be the next best day of your life, mm -hmm. and that yeah, I'm. I'm not as strong as I was in my 30s, and when I was in my 30s, I wasn't as strong as Alex and old is as a right. climber. So I, and not trying to catch up and be competitive with them, but to celebrate that next generation being better artists, being better scientists, being better athletes, and that we're all on this spinning globe for just a very short period of time. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that gets into mentorship and the importance of mentorship. And I want to get into that in a minute. But while we're kind of stuck on Everest here for a minute, uh, you know, you've summited Everest three times. And, you know, I think to the average, you know, person, um, you know, Everest is the ultimate, you know, it's the highest peak. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the most difficult ascent as you, as becomes evident when you watch a film like Meru. But with respect to Everest specifically, you know, over the last, I don't know, 10 or 20 years, you would know better than me. Um, it's almost become like this bucket list item for, you know, the investment banker of the day to say, I'm going to do this, right? So you have this you know, influx of more people than ever descending on this mountain, perhaps, you know, most of which or many of which are not, are ill-equipped or ill-prepared to do it. Um, you know, how, what is your perspective on that, you know, in terms of the amount of people that are treading up, you yeah. know, this, to this hollowed peak, yeah. so to speak? Everest will continue to attract people to go climb it. There is only one point, and it's, if only 3,000 people have climbed it out of 7.5 billion people, it's still a, a sought-after goal. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the people of Nepal, the Sherpa, they have created an industry around getting people to the top. And they are hard workers. They, the, the route has fixed rope from the bottom all the way to the top. So um, it's not a conveyor belt, but it's a safety line that goes all the way to the top. And it's not... This is permanently there. Each season it gets re-equipped. And so there's a tremendous amount of work that the Nepali, in particular the Sherpa people, are doing on behalf of these expeditions that go up there. And the standard route on the south side and the north side, both those routes are, they're unique sort of Everest-type climbing. They're not adventure climbing. It's not first ascent climbing. It's not a different type of climbing. And to, to compare them to those other types of climbing, sort of like the climbing on Meru or the climbing on Yosemite, is you're looking at apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it is. There's a lot of people going up Mount Everest. It is um, a sought-after peak. But in at the end of the day, I'd rather see the investment banker uh, going to climb a mountain because uh, rather than uh, 
hunting a, a, a rare animal. And mm-hmm. that I mean, we, we we don't have enough animals left on this planet, especially those charismatic megafauna that look good above your your mantelpiece. Right. <laughs> so I mean, that's in the news the last yeah, day yeah, or yeah. two. And so it's um, it's not just investment bankers; it's den- <laughs> it's dentists. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Yeah. You could be a mechanic, Anybody, and yeah. yeah. And so there's um, it's a real. Um, climbing a, a big mountain, so it's it's a good thing, especially something like Everest. And it, it's a it employs a lot of people in in Nepal, um, in Nepal and Tibet, and um, as they are they manage and regulate the mountain until they have done a an overview of the carrying capacity and how that mountain can then be managed. It's going to be um, a bit of a um, it's a goat farm over there. Right. So, but this year is the first year since 1974 or something like that that Everest will not have a summit on it. So it's going to sort of recuperate and. Oh, really? So w- I didn't know that. So what is that about? Yeah, the um, with the avalanche that uh, struck base camp as a right. result of the earthquake on the 25th of April, 2015. Mm-hmm. There, um, it's just locked down. Yeah, they closed up the right. season, and I, um, I don't think there are any. Um, Post monsoon expeditions going over there. They'd be setting up right now, and there'd be right. it'd be in the news. But I haven't heard of anyone. So yeah, giving the mountain a rest. And um, yeah, there is some talk in the mountaineering communities to to have another rest year to say, okay, we're no no climbing on Everest. Everyone go climb other peaks. And so right. um, well, the amount of debris that must be accumulating up there has got to be vast right and extensive i mean it's, when you're going yeah. up you must have see stuff all over the place because they're doing so a many good people, job are they yeah they're starting in the 90s they had uh, everest cleanup expeditions and now uh-huh. when you go there you have to post a a bond per person of about a thousand dollars or so that you bring your your rubbish down so I see. there's um there um they're doing a good job with that they're getting it out of there things like oxygen cylinders or souvenirs so there mm-hmm. there's a value to them so you have a, a market force uh, encouraging people to bring them down, and then and the ones that can be reused are, are recycled. But um, yeah, there's um, how we handle that many people um, and the challenges of human waste and, and fresh water on a, a small village of a thousand people that are trying to climb one route are pretty outstanding. And so and until Nepal and Sagamartha National Park comes up with a management plan similar to what. Uh, it, Denali National Park has for climbing Denali, the highest point in Alaska and North America. There's, there'll be a little bit of a challenge of how they um, accommodate that many people. Interesting. So back to this issue of death and the ever-present kind of awareness of its, uh, you know, of its possibility with what you do. I mean, in your own personal story, you've, you know, you've suffered the loss of of several friends, uh, not the least of which was perhaps your best friend, Alex Lowe, right? Who you lost in an avalanche <clears throat> in which you were, you know, because you took a different tack, were able to survive, but you still, <laughs> you were in an avalanche, yes. Yeah. And what year was that? That was 99. Uh, right. October 5th. And uh, in the wake of that, um, you ultimately ended up marrying his his uh his bride and and taking in his three sons and you guys have been married now for 12 years 14, 14 years yeah. yeah and so that's a very unique and interesting experience that the film explores in some respects um but what was that like sort of stepping into you know that family and being responsible for raising those boys it was uh a gift. It was a, it's been a wonderful journey, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and there's sort of uh, Shisha Pongma is the one 8,000 meter peak that's entirely in Tibet. And by Tibetan culture, when there is a, um, a fatality, it's the brother that then steps in and takes care of that the brother's mm. family. And so when we were there, the the guys that were helping us out, and they were like, "Oh my gosh!" and l- even as we walked out of the mountains and my shoulder was in a sling and I had been banged up and cracked ribs and they were like, we've got to take care of them. And the conversations you have a lot of these people there, they're not, they're not the volume that you and I have had in our own 
native tongue or mother tongue back and forth and big ideas and things like this. There's always sort of simple ideas. So that might have been the foundation to it. And then coming back and being with Jenny, knowing um, Max, uh, Sam, and Isaac since Max was two, and then being there for Sam and Isaac's birth and, and being with them. And um, that uh, love is a, you put love in the equation, it's a great mm-hmm. healing thing. And mm-hmm. um, Max is with with us here and Jenny's with us here and, and, and when we're here in Southern California and just working on a film together and kind of um, it's been a great journey to have a family in that sense and mm-hmm. um, to uh, uh, yeah it's a unique story I guess yeah and I think I think what's also you know an interesting kind of thing to mine is how that impacted your perception of climbing your risk analysis um, and, you know, how you made choices about future expeditions, because at your core, you are a climber. This is who you are. This is what you do. And, and you could, you know, couldn't avoid climbing as much as you could avoid having to go to the bathroom. Like if this is, this is, you know, who you are, it's in your DNA, right? So how do you, so it's this journey of reconciling that with, you know, the fact that, that you're now responsible for these boys who already lost their father and, and this woman who already lost her husband. Does that change how you decide to tackle a climb? Certain climbs that have a higher level of objective risk, and that's walking under something with a potential to avalanche on you or an ice block breaking off, and that would be... Um, um, what, that was what killed Alex and David and and Shishapangla and so trying to avoid those type of climbs but mm-hmm. that being said having made 10 trips through the ice fall that people can say well <laughs> that's a load of malarkey yeah I mean you still like, went through it, it. so <laughs> yeah so like oh, oh all right so what is acceptable <laughs> risk I mean your definition is is fluid and distinct from the average human being right like this is that's a moving target yeah and I've spent a lifetime understanding the mountains and, and what they uh, dynamics of snow and ice mm-hmm. and that's really the challenge in Himalayan peaks is that you have that level of um all the ice that's hanging up there and how do you how do you get around that but um there's uh yeah um it, it, and if I were to go do if I were to go into a surgery theater and perform a surgery I would botch it and I would kill yeah, that person that's and so an that, unacceptable <laughs> risk yeah, analysis yeah and so that there's you just it's whatever you do and uh-huh. whatever, whatever you know best and a, a good firefighter is going to know all every time they step into a, an incident they're going to learn more about that building right and, and, and that's what we're built upon and in your experience in terms of um, where you are with uh, with your podcasting books and podcasting <laughs> <now>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's well, we funny. But we all build on experience, and so there was, um, there's a, um, but I, it, this might sound crazy, but I, I, I think that, yeah, what I do, I know when it's going to be risky. I, on the, right. I'll go to Nepal again, and I'll do another trip, and I'll, I'll climb these climbs, but I'm, I'm there at that moment, and then I have to make decisions and assess the situation and the locale and, and whether is it good to go up and, and things like that and make sound decisions the best I can whether or not and then also knowing that you can always turn around and come mm-hmm. back and it's not climbing ultimately isn't worth dying for and you want to mm-hmm. come back and, and and share that experience but that moment of making that decision to turn around that like critical decision point moment uh, I would imagine is informed by deep intuition which is informed by a lifetime of experience, uh, which is contributed to by your sense of hypervigilance, right? All of these things come into play to help you make that decision. So I would imagine when an instinct creeps up in you, like we got to go down or we keep going, that's not coming out of nowhere. That's coming out of a lifetime of doing this. Yeah. So it's a much more reliable intuition or instinct than... The investment bankers instead. <laughs> yeah, and they might, you know. they might be able to make sound decisions based on their experience with it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it goes, um, it's a, yeah, it's, I mean, but 
I could be a race car driver. That's dangerous stuff. Or, mm -hmm. or I could have played football for a bunch. I mean, there we know there's risk associated with that. And there's, um, I mean, people that don't take care of their bodies. And they're, you know, where is that? And so. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, things. you know, people watch what Alex Honnold does. And it's absolutely mind boggling that somebody yeah. could be so composed in, you know, in the process of, you know, climbing up, you know, the, those faces that he climbs without any ropes, without any safety net. Uh, but he will tell you that he's done a risk analysis and that there, that he's completely comfortable in, in what he's tackling and to the average person that it doesn't compute at all. Right. So yeah. that's what I mean about like a sort of moving target of risk analysis yeah. based on experience. Um, but when you look at, like, you know, like on this subject of death, you know, we're kind of still in the wake of, of Dean Potter's passing, and, and we're in this kind of phase of, of that version of climbing, which is a very different kind of climbing than you do, where the envelope is getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And it, it seems like, to me, as a layperson, that it's accelerating at a quite rapid rate with the wingsuit jumps and the slack lining and all this sort of thing, um, to the extent that even... You know, Cliff pulled out of sponsoring some of these athletes because they're freaked out at the risk level. Um, you know, what is your perception of that as somebody who knows more about these things than almost anyone else? Yeah, and I'm happy that people go out and they push the limit and they they accept risk. And it's um, yeah, people are going to say, oh, they're absolutely crazy. And you know, these proximity wingsuit jumpers, the, the fellows that thread needles and all these things and they know what they're doing and they know what the risk and the consequences of those, um, of what's going on there. And that, um, there's, I'm, I think it's a healthy thing. People need to go out there and need to push the envelope. And it's, whenever this happens, everyone's like, Oh, Dean and this and that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this huge burden and this cost to society. And it's like, well, yeah, it, Having to do a body recovery in Yosemite is less expensive than someone going into uh, critical care or chronic care mm -hmm. as an old person or something like that. I'm using that as a very numbers-based type thing. So, yeah, Dean is a great guy. Respect, and, yeah, it's tragic and it's sad, especially for his family that, that were there, that were so close to, to him and to be affected by it. But um, to say that we should... Any of these pursuits where your where body injury is 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 a chance is should not be good is, is a little bit crazy and mm -hmm. so we're we single out base jumpers and and climbers soloists and all these Himalayan climbers because it's super risky but yet on the other side of it, it's like well yeah we love football and in football you're probably eighty ninety percent chance that you're going to have concussive cerebral injuries mm -hmm. and when you're my age then or we're about the same age you're going to be there's challenges that you're going to have because you played football that whole time and so does bud light pull out of sponsoring nfl because they know it's injurious to people and it's right. a bad thing and yet you know everyone's like we have an energy bar that says oh we can't do this on there so there's um there's sort of um because it's we do this on our own volition, and there is a high mortality rate, and that it, it's um, that yeah you it's a very very brutal death mm -hmm. flying into the mountain. There's nothing. Well, yeah, they're spectacular. Yeah, you know, and, and car wrecks. And, and, and now more thing. and more they're being filmed because everybody's got a GoPro, and that's a whole other you know conversation about. Um, the sharing of these exploits and how they might fuel and inform, you know, some people taking an unacceptable level of risk, you know, to get the clip or whatever. Um, but at the same time, this is the burden of the explorer and the pioneer. It's sort of yeah. like they've accepted that mantle and that's that goes with the territory. And culturally, you know, it's this not love-hate, but like this weird relationship where we want to see them do it, but then this weird schadenfreude when something bad happens and then we have to have a, you know, a cultural regrouping where we say we can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we love our heroes, but we like to then attack them or criticize them as well. So, but it's fascinating to watch 
how climbing is progressing in that regard. Like I saw Valley Uprising and that was quite amazing to see kind of the history in Yosemite and how, how it's evolved by these guys, you know, sort of learning from each other and, you know, each person taking it to the next level. And, but it does seem like it's accelerating quite quickly right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, what's next? Yeah. Well, I look at the mountain biking. It's mm-hmm. like, it was sort of like, remember the coaster bikes with the reverse brake? Yeah. And you'd like yeah, do a skid yeah. turn around the trees and that was like mountain biking. And now right. the, riding these spines and. and right. Well, Danny like, McCaskill, what he yeah. does in those movies, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So it's, um, and I'm happy for it. This is, let's go. I mean, it's, um, we've got 350 million people in the United States and, and we are here because or 320 or whatever million we have seven and a half billion on this planet. And, you can, as long as you're not harming other people and, and malicious and, and mean and things like that, go out and have fun. And mm-hmm. so, it, um, yeah, it's an it's a intense conversation. And I'm at the, I have, a, I have a very firm views on it because I get, I'm a, I have a target on my back because mm-hmm. of that. Because I'm, they're like, well... You know, here you are. You lost your best friend climbing, and then you marry his widow, and you raise his kids to be climbers, and the same thing. And, and just that's not a, a good thing. And so, some people think it's their prerogative to come in and, and tell other people how to live. Right. So, how do you respond to that? I'm a. It's a, well. There's one way you can say it. You know, opinions are like toothbrushes. Everyone has their own toothbrush. So. Uh huh. Um, you don't necessarily want to share them, but. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, air of, um, I, I generally don't, I mean, I don't. Don't engage. I don't engage because it just doesn't, it doesn't, uh, the people that mean a lot to me, they understand. And people that are, are friends and, and they know where we're at and that have a, um, a, a meaningful life, they, they understand that. And there's... Um, a meaningful life by my standards, people that have the same value set. And mm-hmm. so, and you understand why we go out and do these things and what, what's important in life. And perhaps many of the listeners out there do too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that may Rue addresses, you know, like Mallory, isn't, isn't Mallory the one who's responsible for the quote when asked like, why do you climb and why do you tackle these mountains? And he said, because it's there. Yeah. So we all know that quote. Yeah. We didn't necessarily know that it was Mallory who said it, yeah. but Meru kind of updates that response in some regard. Yeah. And I won't spoil it. You should go out and see the movie. But it's a much more nuanced um, thing yeah. than that, you know. And I've been thinking a lot about <clears throat> balance lately, subject of balance and, and moderation, you know. And as somebody who's done ultra endurance events and, and, you know, and I know what that's like and it's kind of a different version of, of what you do, what you do. It has some kind of overlap and. You know, last weekend I went out to Utah to help the Iron Cowboy finish his 50th Ironman in 50 states in 50 days. And, oh. you know, what he's accomplished is just extraordinary. You know, yeah. it really, it defies, I, I think it's one of the greatest achievements in human endurance. And it's, it was really touching and beautiful to be there to, to witness it. And, and to see the response of people, like he had like over a thousand people there cheering him on in his home state of Utah. And it was the amount of love that was surrounding him. It was really cool. And yet we're in this culture where this idea of balance is reinforced, like live a balanced life and everything in moderation and all this sort of thing. And, and I've always said, like, I struggle with balance. Like I vacillate between extremes and I'm just prone to that. I'm attracted to that. I'm magnetized to that. And what does that mean? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Should I um, refrain from judging that? Um, but when you look at sort of the great achievements of mankind, these were achieved by people who were arguably out of balance by our sort of cultural paradigm, you know, definition of, of what that is. It's sort of like we're told to be in balance, yet we celebrate people that are out of balance, but then we tell them you're out of balance. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Like, what? Oh, how yeah. do you, how do you kind of, you know, approach balance? And you know, I think, I think, in the macro sense, you're living a very balanced life. You're a great dad to these three boys. You're, 
you know, you, you're a loving husband, you've been married 14 years, you go off and do these extreme things. But if someone's, you know, like when you're on the mountain, maybe your life is temporarily out of balance. But in the macro, like, I think you're living a balanced life where your priorities are in check. I thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so I'm sure you get this question all the time, or, you know, that criticism of, living out of balance. I mean, maybe that's just a different variation on the, the question I just asked you, but. Yeah. Well, I hope that it, that it is in balance and that um, being in the mountains and doing these expeditions brings some degree of balance back to it. Mm -hmm. So that that's the, that adventure out there. And yes, we do. You look at Lewis and Clark that marched across North America and they were, um, you know, they were seen as crazy and, and, they weren't. And same thing with Shackleton. At mm -hmm. his time, in his time, he wasn't. He wasn't. When he came back, not having made it across Antarctica in 1917, and that was, he became a hero later in life. So we're, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Public figures. It's a different. Well, I also think that because being a climber is who you are, and climbing is what you do that when you're climbing, you are in your bliss. So you are balanced in that regard. Like yeah. you are grounded and present and you are, you are the best version of yourself when you are engaged in doing that yeah. because that's what you love to do. And if people can find that in whatever they do and whether it's becoming the best barista that makes the most perfect flowers on the phone uh -huh. or the best chess player or artist or... It, when people have a sense of purpose and a drive and what they want to do, that is probably the most important thing. And a lot of people that I communicate with that are in HR and employing people, that's one of the things they look for is, is, is this person have something they're passionate about and they want to excel and they want to do good at? And, and then ask about that. And those are traits that then um, encourage people to do good. And I'm fortunate to have found that climbing was my calling and being able to follow it and especially thankful to society for allowing me to pursue it to the degree that I have. Mm -hmm. But also giving back, right? Yeah. Like, so let's talk about mentorship a little bit. I mean, you had great mentors and, and now you're at a point in your career where mentoring the younger generation has become an important thing to you. And that's reflected in the, in the movie as well uh, with Jimmy and Renard. And it's, you know, I'm interested in exploring kind of what that means to you and, and how you carry that mantle. Well, we, um, we're the sum total of everyone that came before us. So if we look at this collective ball of knowledge and each generation passes it on and is able to add to it and then move it on to the next one. And so if you can get close to that ball of energy or hold the ball or touch it, um, and then you're there to bring it to the hands of the next generation here. Um, I mean, that's sort of what mentorship is about. Mm -hmm. And you look at where we are as humans today with everything from technology and science and the arts and philosophy. Um, it's all related to humans moving that ball of knowledge forward and then sharing it with the next, with the previous generation. And climbing is very particular in that way because it's so, it's a mechanical type thing. You have to set up the ropes, you have the carabiners, there's belay techniques, there's, you have to setting things up. And so I had someone that literally showed me the ropes. And so there's that, that learning of how to do it. And yes, you can learn to climb as a kid without any prior education. You see kids climbing up trees and on boulders and it's just innate in them. They get mm -hmm. out and they want to go to the top of that little hump there and they want to climb that tree and mom's like ah get down mm -hmm. <laughs> dad's like be safe and so we're kind of untraining them from that and then right you want to see a mountain you go i want to go climb there and then you have to learn from those those uh that rope and everything on that and there's um in terms of like mentorship uh, there's nothing i can teach alex and old i mean the guy's way better climber than i ever was or ever will be. And so there's not like from a climbing standpoint, but... But he doesn't have experience in the kind of climbing that you do. Yeah, or life experience and things like that. And then mm -hmm. encouraging them. And, and that was, for me, what my great... When Muggs, who was my mentor, said, yeah, you can do this. And then to, to say that you can do it and to give them 
that responsibility rather than sort of hanging on to it and 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 saying being possessive of it but to say okay your it's your turn now and you move on mm-hmm. with it and i think that's uh for an athlete that's our age to rather than trying to say oh, i'm going to try to be there with those guys and try to compete with them and all yeah. this and that it should be like wow um age gracefully and be supportive of the people and and realize that when you pursue it at whatever level you're doing that the essence of doing it that that joy of doing it is the same as when you were doing it at the very highest level mm-hmm. so there's um like the old time climbers um uh, that were climbing the gunks into their 80s and so they had pioneered the sport but they were still going out there and climbing at this a very at a level that gave them a, a ton of fun right interesting yeah and there's the beautiful moment in the movie where uh you're about to finally summit meru and it's all lined up for you to be the first one up and and you sort of pass the mantle on to jimmy and that's sort of a very palpable like tactile way of saying you know i'm the mentor and you're the next generation it's yeah. a beautiful moment it was uh I heard that it w- it wasn't originally in the movie either, right? Like that's yeah. such a, a huge character, you know, moment in the movie. Yeah, Chai discovered it, so she's like, "Ah, this is it." And yeah, it was um, it's sort of like uh, the um, but at that point we had we were so close in two thousand eight, and then so we basically did the second ascent all the way up, except for those last two pitches and right. one of them was really time consuming and difficult that was the one that we turned back on that would have forced us in overnight and we would have just been um, we did the right thing we got back and no one was injured and looking back now on the, the story of Meru that it from 2003 to 2011 the, the time that took me eight years to climb it mm-hmm. um, was it was fitting that it was there but when we got to that being that close it was like okay Jimmy, it's your lead, and right. we're going to get to the top. But it's always, um, it's uh, when I'm with my climbing partners, I'm always like, "You go first to the." And I remember uh, this great guy, Jay Smith, that I climbed with, and we'd always be like, "Oh no, you first! No, you <laughs> get to the summit." We'd just, like almost get uh-huh. into like, "No, no, 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 no!" After you, <laughs> to be the first person to to stand on this the summit because you were kind of a team, and it's one of those. Um, well, the the level of trust and the bond that you have yeah. with those guys when your life is literally in their hands yeah. is got to be like nothing else. Yeah. And as a kid, I love running and I love going out and doing track, and I always hear about these races where there'd be two guys and they would be like struggling doing the marathon and then they would come through the uh, the finish line hand in hand and Mm -hmm. win it as a team that would be just like wow that's pretty cool i mean those things well that goes back to your earliest sort of perception of sport and being kind of you know anti the competitive aspect of it the the victor versus the also ran yeah and it was i mean there's probably other things in it but it was um um, you know, having a a unique name and kind of in just <laughs> you know playing football on a military base in Frankfurt, Germany as a kid, and it was just like whoa. I mean, it was it was uh, there was sort of this this um, I, I didn't respond. It just was difficult. I mean, the right. the bullying that went on there as a kid. I was like, oh, so I'm gonna do the opposite whenever I see someone that can, I can lend a hand or help out to, or, um, so, I mean, even, it, it, I think it, it changed my life because I wasn't the one that was, I was, uh, I had to be, and it, it, maybe it changed who I am, but it was, just, I sort of was like, oh, this isn't, at the end of the day, I didn't feel like a good person. I didn't right. feel like that, they, they were my, it was my team, but I just, it, it was just sort of like, wasn't you. I didn't. <laughs> wasn't you. So, well. Well, I realized that we didn't even set the stage about what Meru is and and sort of the uh, the mystique around this particular mountain, the, the shark's fin uh, in particular, and how that had kind of defied climbers for 30 years of attempts, right? No one had been able to summit this, and you'd made a couple attempts, and 
the movie is really a chronicle of, you know, trying to finally be the first guys up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, this, is that accurate? Yeah, it's, it's accurate. <laughs> I mean, it, it um, yeah, um, uh, there was this one, there's, there's three peaks on Meru, that, mm-hmm. and the central has this shark's fin that looks like a, um, almost like a, like a shark's fin or a, like the flame of a candle that kind of comes up out of a the base of this glacier and it's really aesthetic looking and teams had tried it but it was many climbs you'll have the most difficult stuff at the at the lower part and then intermediate stuff in the middle and the mm-hmm. easy stuff on the top the middle stuff was still middle stuff on this climb but the easy stuff was at the bottom and the most difficult stuff was at the top so that slow going big wall climbing like you have on Yosemite and El Capitan that required we had to get that equipment up to the base of that and that brought the necessity of more equipment and more time going into it. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that kind of comes across is your approach to climbing uh, in terms of uh, perceiving the long game, right? Like not just not rushing things, being able to have a responsible level of patience and, you know, knowing when to back down and that goes back into acceptable risk, but, but always having the long game in mind, Right? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? There, well, I guess the base of it, the mountain's always there another day. So if you don't make it up that day, you can try it again. But um, that we're always climbing at the, um, being fortunate with the weather, um, that there's a um, a break in the weather, and that we're we're not conquering it necessarily, but rather we're finding an opportunity to climb it mm-hmm. that gives us the. Uh, sort of the, the a break in that right um, so that's sort of the um, the the basis of that the um, but also that um, there just to be always a little bit more patient so um, it's you'll get there eventually mm-hmm. <laughs> so which is tough because if you're too patient in driving here in L.A., you'll never get there. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, if you really want to get ahead of me, go ahead. And, right. You know, people just drive fast. and like, But uh, you have to, it's like, not Bozeman. swim. <laughs> this is not Bozeman. Yeah, people slow down and let p- the pedestrians cross or something like that. But, it, um, yeah, they're the long game. We're always um, live to see another day. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in exploring... Uh, <clears throat> something you, I'm sure you get asked about all the time, so my apologies, but it has to do with, you know, your relationship with fear, right? Um, which I think is probably unique. Uh, and it's interesting because we kind of live in a fear-based culture, right? If you watch the news, everything is premised upon, like, making us very afraid, right? Like, don't go outside or terrorist attacks or, or what have you, Um and the kind of fear that you deal with is is very different. Um, is it about conquering fear? Is it accepting fear? Is it that you're not afraid? Like, how does that work for you? Fear at its very basic instinct is our self-preservation instinct. And so that's what has driven humans to become where we are. So we can see what fear is and then change it and and, and, and do and make decisions based upon it. And the fear that I encounter is on by my own volition. So I'm going to go up on this big wall, and it's a scary place. Humans mm-hmm. aren't meant to be with that amount of exposure and, and those type of temperatures and things like that. So I can overcome that fear with experience and by having the right equipment and things like that, and then um, that knowledge that I've been in a similar situation in the past, and that I can then do it. But... Um, I tend to, um, I'm very accepting of humans, so I'm not like, oh, I'm in a, this is a rough part of town, I should be afraid. I'll be like, okay, I'm here and I have good intent, I'm not I'm not trying to do anything and, and I've never had any problems with that and maybe I'm naive mm-hmm. or something like that. And But I think a lot of fear is, is conditioned upon what society tells us. And so we might be like, we make snap judgments. We're looking at a certain person and saying, well, that person is going to be bad. There's going to be problems with it, and they're going to to see things in a different way. And to really not make judgments about people, particularly, um, or locations or places that you are, will 
make you less fearful. And mm-hmm. um, there's, uh, yeah, what do I fear in life? Um, uh, driving because it's so fast and, and you see car accidents uh-huh. and you're like, oh my God. Driving keeps coming up as a theme here. <sighs> it's definitely something that <laughs> triggers you. Well, I spent three <laughs> hours driving yesterday yeah, okay. and it was, I mean, yeah, you drive from Bozeman to Missoula and you put it on cruise control and you can uh-huh. download a couple podcasts and you're just looking out there and then so but yeah when you're on the 405 in rush hour <laughs> like i was last night it was a scary experience i was like <laughs> white knuckling that conrad and, and, anchor <laughs> is terrified of the 405 but meru is not an issue yeah well meru i, I knew what i was getting into and mm-hmm. the cold is an adversary that i can understand and i can i can work with it but um so the semi on the 405 and lane changers and the motorcyclists that are splitting lanes, I mean, those guys scare me because mm-hmm. what if I wasn't paying 100% attention at that time and I clipped them and they had to wipe out and I don't want to have that on my shoulders. I mean, it's just like all these things are landing on me. <laughs> trying right, to right, right. deal with them at one moment. So, How do these high stakes adventures that you've been on kind of inform how you navigate your daily life? You know, I think, uh, you know, somebody might say, well, you're, you're so used to this extreme level of excitement uh, that the rest of your life might be boring. But I have a feeling that that's not the case. No, it, um, it's things, if you, on most of these expeditions, the ones that I've done with Jimmy, like walking across Tibet, and you end up running out of food. So it's like, okay. And you end up dehydrating yourself and all those things. So when you uh-huh. come back, you're like, wow this is tea. This is really cool. And I went to the coffee shop and the person made me a cup of coffee and it cost me $2. I mean, that's like really amazing. Yeah. And I'm like (laughs) happy and thankful for that person. Uh And and they're like, it's like a good human interaction so that, and you're able to hold on to that. Not having, so not having all these creature comforts. I mean, so many people are like, they're just like, so like my, my coffee, it's five degrees off and I'm in a rush and, and are, does it take you that long? And, and mm-hmm. just a little bit of patience and courtesy with those things. And especially for the people that are working there. And that, um, I think that, that influences us. So sort of that being on these long expeditions makes you appreciate the simple things in life, like a soft bed and a, a well-prepared meal and, mm-hmm. and conversations and your cell phone working, things like that. And, I mean, nowadays, it's sort of like we're so programmed that, my gosh, I don't have five bars on my 3G. That's a disaster. Mm-hmm. Or I spilled coffee on you my You only have outfit. 3G? <laughs> oh, now it's 4G. Yeah, okay, come on, Montana. Conrad. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, yeah, I guess I'm really out of it now. So, okay, I didn't get the come fastest. On old, come on, old man. Yeah, I mean... My phone has a, a clip-in loop on it. So I know, I noticed that's where that. I, like, <laughs> what I do with my... <laughs> you clip that onto your belt? Like, how does that work? Oh, yeah. So you can I hang can take, it there. I'm so. going to take a picture of that. Yeah, how you... Um, and you can also put it on your wrist. You can girth hitch it. Uh-huh. You can hang it in your tent so you could... Right, gotcha. Uh, ...listen to a Rich Roll podcast. Of course, right. sitting in your tent, and, which is, and, you know, download a bunch. I mean, right. these things Up have on changed. the portal ledge. These have changed expedition climbing. I mean, it's sort of like... I mean, back in the day, we would have Walkmans and we'd have cassettes. And mm-hmm. I remember there was always one side of the cassette that was better than the other. And so you'd sit there and you'd get a number two pencil and you'd rewind the whole thing so you could listen to that right. tape again. And then the batteries would get low and it wouldn't just shut off. It'd go... Right, right, right. Now you can watch movies and TV shows. Movies, TV shows, <laughs> yeah. listen to all your music. You can, you can update your address book. I mean, it's... I mean, this technology, the way technology has advanced in the last 10 or 15 years has got me completely excited for what it's going to be doing in the Mm -hmm. next 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that gets into kind of, you know, you're also an entrepreneur. It seems like you've got, you know, 10 businesses going and all kinds of other stuff, uh, you know, off the mountain as well, right? (laughs) What's going on? What's the the latest thing that you're working on right now? We, um, yeah. if you have ideas, follow your ideas. And so I'm kind of a idea person. I get people excited about them and then I want to get them rolling on that idea mm-hmm. and we build them together. But, um, and working with, um, meeting various people from various disciplines. And so, uh, Bruce Johnson, who's a, uh, research, um, clinician from the Mayo Clinic in, um, Rochester, Minnesota, he and I were in Everest together and, 
in uh, 2012, and then working with another fellow, Alex Phillip, out of Missoula, Montana, who's a data, and another fellow, Stephen Marshall, who's out of London, San Francisco area. And so coming together with these different ideas that we can then, uh, and pulling into different areas, and the, what we're working on now is this, our working uh, title on this is uh, working group. It's is Medalist, which is uh, medical data and lifestyle. And so, if we have three, each of these three different Medalist. Data, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's um, so it's just an acronym. Kind right. Of. I got gotcha. you. So I pulled them all together. So we have um, we're looking at the health of the, the people in the United States. So this what we're talking about now is health, where people are, how they're staying healthy, and and the cost to it. So um, Alex is a data guy, and so he works with big data. So He's from a GIS background, and so they've done um, mapping and things like that. And then now that we can keep adding layers and layers of data, so you can add in um, stuff from the census, you can add in stuff, uh, data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and you can look at all these different areas and then kind of figure out the health of individuals. And it comes down to where you live, uh, down to Mm. a really... So if you are... Again, and another sort of blue zones analogy. It is. And so working with that and trying to, to tie in with what uh, Dan Boytner has been working on with that. So it's, again, extrapolating on that. So they're able to look at, say, if you are um, in an area that is downwind of an oil refinery, your chance, you're going to be that much more likely to have melanoma. If you live in um, East L.A. and this is your demographic and you live in a food desert, your risk of type 2 diabetes is going to be that much greater. Mm-hmm. If And so breaking it down into each of these individual areas, and you can look at it county by county in, in the United States of where people are healthy and what they're not doing. And so taking that information and then um, there's sort of a, that's the data part of it. So we can look at macro data, which is big amounts of data that looks at every le- level of where people are where they're healthy, what they're doing in society. And then you have the, the micro data, which is the data that you would get off, say, of a, a, a fitness watch or your own medical mm-hmm. test that tells you on a day-to-day basis how healthy you are. And, and that's improving all the time because you can look on your right. – you can track what you're eating on your phone and, and be more aware of that and the more aware of it that you are. So trying to combine big data, micro data, macro and micro data on that. Um, so that's the data com- – com- um, and then there's the medical component of this, and that is – the hospitals, which are the providers, there's the insurance companies, which are the payers, and then there's pharma, which is the other part of that. Mm-hmm. And then the third component of it is lifestyle, and that's where guys like you and I fit in because we're out there as proponents for a healthy lifestyle. What are we going to do to get healthier and be healthier? And so having read Dan's book, having met Dan at a conference and interacted with him, great guy kind of like I'm fascinated by that. So he's taking data. He's not just saying, oh, I heard about guys, families that live in Georgia over in the Caucasus that eat yogurt that live to be 120. He's actually gone down and mined the data and knows exactly where they are and then trying to to pull that out. And some of your podcasts are about those those, you know, linking mm-hmm. data of a guy that says, okay, there's more PhDs in Switzerland. They eat more chocolate. So if you eat chocolate, you're going to be <laughs> right, smarter. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like... Let's, let's get really focused on this and looking at it. So then working with our group that we have there, and we sort of meet in a way that we're just brainstorming. We're not trying to sell anything to anyone like that. But how can we bend the curve on the, the health of, of people? And so the lifestyle part of it is where we get out and we exercise. We encourage people to, to live a healthy life, to eat healthier, um, to be more mindful of what they're doing to their bodies. And then the other part of the lifestyle is that it, it does come into um, our society, which is, is governed by government, and, and that is run by politics. So you have an example in New York City where they say you the 72-ounce the drinks, there's something we have to sue that. And some people you have to change that. There's too much sugar in there. And so other people are saying you're taking away our the right to be mm. in that point. So bringing all of those groups together and then brainstorming on ways that we can help um, create a healthier society. That's kind of our... Right. Our, That's a big lofty goal. It's a big lofty but goal. But it's a worthy one. Yeah. And if someone's it's got a worthy a, one. It, and we have fun with it and um, it's really, um, it's neat to see, um, to, to engage all these different areas. And so... Right. They're... Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's really similar to what Dan's doing with his Blue Zones projects and how mm-hmm. he goes into these cities, you know, because he'll tell you, and he probably said to you, like, 
the, the best way to help people is to change their environment. So when you look at, for example, the example you used, a, a, you know, an East L.A. neighborhood that's a food desert, well, we now realize that the, the incidence of type 2 diabetes there is because it's a food desert. So how do we change that? Yeah. Like, you know, we're not going to get all these people to move. And, you know, you, they can all go see Meru and be inspired, but is that going to translate into them changing their habits? Like, that's a harder thing, you know hard. what I mean? But if you can surround them with healthier options that are at an arm's length away or, you know, build bike paths or, you know, I don't know, you know, certain kinds, kinds of, um, you know, uh, things that are in the environment that kind of foster a healthier lifestyle is the way that you're going to ultimately get these communities to improve. And the harsh reality is that people respond to economic incentive. And so the insurance companies are seeing this. They're saying, right. where's a type 2 diabetic is going to cost us $200,000 or something like that, especially if it's, I mean, it can be really, and that's just one of the, mm -hmm. the five um, top killers that are, that, that are lifestyle related. So they have an incentive to say, let's see if we can incentivize people to become healthier rather than paying for another three wings in a big hospital like right. that. So, well, the employers too, because they're the yeah. ones who have to pay these insurance premiums, you know, for their workforce. Th so those they, are what wellness programs are yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and as companies become more progressive and they understand their, their wellness programs. And so it's, um, and it's, I'm, I'm excited because I'm a mountain climber, but I get to hang out with these really bright people in, in medicine and, and, and data and, and, and kind of get ideas going there. I'm sure they're, they're very excited to hang out with you too. That's <laughs> probably, you're probably the coolest guy that they get to hang out with. I, I brought the basketball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So a couple questions I want to ask you before we, before we wrap it up. <clears throat> the first one is, you know, in raising these three boys, you know, what are the, what are the values that are most important to you that you instill in them as they mature into men? The, um, I guess, is a, a sense of decency and compassion for other humans is, is the, the end goal that we want to have with raising the children, Jenny and I. So to be kind and generous to other people. And so that's a good um, foundation for that. And as a parent, to get there, there's, um, there's expectations and boundaries. So, and I've set them on myself. And so what do you, um, w what are those expectations and boundaries? Mm -hmm. And everyone has a different uh, set of them. And with our boys, uh, the, our expectations is that you'll play an instrument in high school, you'll learn a second language in high school, and you will graduate university. And so if they get those three things done, I think mm -hmm. they'll have those. And we're fortunate to be, to be able to do that. Not everyone has that ability. I realize that, and I don't want to sound like I'm... Like so I, I want to sound, I don't want to sound pompous. I want to no, sound I got grounded. You. I got it, you. It, it, those are the values, uh -huh. and that's what's important to us. The and, instrument thing, though, because you were a trumpet player, and your dad was a trumpet player, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so music. Yeah, there is a sense of tenacity that you that, and, and repetition practice, and then language and music they build neural pathways that we now understand that um, are beneficial. So and. Maybe computer games are doing the same things. We, they're still out there. But the computer games are kind of more of a treat. They're kind of like a soft mm -hmm. serve ice cream cone. They're not mm -hmm. really <laughs> like you've got to go learn a second language. So, Have any of your boys discovered like that passion that's going to fuel their life yet? Do they know what they want to do and be? Yeah. Um, Max is the oldest, and he's uh, a photographer and a videographer, and he's really enjoying that um, in, in the outdoor space. And so not as an athlete as Alex and I am, um, uh, but more in sort of the sharing the story and doing things. He loves mm -hmm. that. Sam is um, going into his senior year as a, uh, um, a film student at Montana State. So he loves stop animation and making movies and, and those kind of things. And Isaac is a freshman at Western Washington in Bellingham with a keen interest in the natural sciences and ecology. So they're, um, and it's... That's cool. So they all have a pretty good idea of yeah, they're, what they're, they're interested they in. They want to do something that's that's really, that, that's good. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, if they wanted to 
Well, good job. Lounge around and eat potato chips. I would, <laughs> yeah. I would find joy in that. I wouldn't want to be too harsh on them, but uh-huh. I guess I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a taskmaster. Are you a ta- are you are you a little bit of a hard ass or no? I think so. Are you? I mean, yeah. The, my fellow teammates <laughs> mm-hmm. joke about it, and I'm on expedition, and I'm that way with myself, and it, um, and it's uh, there's um, you know, as when. Those formative years, those the the boundaries and expectations, I think, are two key parts to parenting. That that um, and that you can understand that. And so there's certain um, certain things. So it doesn't come as a surprise. And you want right. to get your children set to when they eventually become to go out in society. That it is, it's. You have to earn your keep. It's hard work out there. Not everyone's going to be friendly, but if you're friendlier, you'll you'll mm-hmm. have better luck, and you might be happier at it. So, mm-hmm. if you could go back in time and uh, give a 20 year old Conrad Anchor a little piece of advice based upon what you've learned, what would that be? I would be uh, probably do more stretching and more yoga. That's I it. <laughs> Well, I, uh, there's probably other bigger philosophically, maybe. philosophically, um, we could all stretch a little more. Yeah. I mean, it's so, yeah, yoga is great. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. but, um, and the breathing aspect of it probably, oh, it, probably in your twenties as a young person, you're kind of self-absorbed. I mean, the world is about you. You don't realize that, um, your impact with other people and things like that. So, and that comes with, um, that, that knowledge, that wisdom comes with experience and age. And some people are born with it and some people have it through Mm -hmm. circumstance and experiences that have changed them. If you got a tap on your shoulder, uh, by the next president said, Conrad, I'd like you to be secretary of the interior. (laughs) You know, as somebody who's more in touch with our natural resources and our natural environment, um, you know, if you were given that kind of responsibility over uh, managing our resources, what do you think, what do you think needs us to, what do you, where do you think our attention should be focused? Well, Hats off first to Sally Jewell. She's doing a great job as Secretary of the Interior. And she comes from a recreation background. And it's, she manages, her department and team manages more land in the United States than, than anyone along those lines. But the challenge is when uh, in the interior is that you have national forests and you have uh, BLM land. You have public land that has resources on them. And how do we look at those various, um, the the assets that are, held within those lands, whether it's timber, coal, or natural gas. Those are the sort of the three uh, peak ones that were there. And yes, we need to have energy to run our society. And these microphones are powered by mm-hmm. it. And we're, we can't escape that. Um, and the first step to understanding energy consumption is, is knowing that we consume it and at what level and trying to, to be mindful of that. But um, some of the other um, ways that we would uh, see the, um, uh, the 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 price that we pay for carbon fuel here as citizens of the United States is below the market value in the rest of the world. So I go to Nepal and it's a poor landlocked country. They have no uh, coal or natural gas. They have some hydro. Um, and how do they? what is the price of gasoline for their vehicles? It's about four times what we pay here. So mm-hmm. that influences their decisions and how they, they do that. Um, and, and so, again, it comes back to what we were mentioning about the market economy affecting change within people. We look at Hawaii, where electricity is something far more expensive than it is here um, in the, in, on the mainland United States, That because all the the carbon that's used to generate the electricity has to be mm-hmm. imported. So all of a sudden, solar is very cost-effective. So as the price of conventional electricity rises and the price of alternative energy, wind, um, solar, and hydro drops, hydro is more fixed than those other two because the technology is continually improving, then it becomes more of a, um, it's a different change. And so 
if I had that job. And I wouldn't want it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it can't be a, it can't be an easy job. Yeah, you have a lot of people that you're trying to keep happy, and it's um it's a, a lot of respect for anyone that takes on that works in the government. And always, I'm not I'm I always thank people that work in the government rather than being antagonistic and hmm. and angry at them. But the finding that that point where we can address that energy consumption is sort of the the key thing that that we need to get our um as a cult uh, as a country in the united states and that's um when we're something like seven percent of the world's population yet we consume about 30 percent of the world's resources although china emits more co2 than we do we are per capita far more as each individual we use more energy mm. and so there's that um this point now where we're Maybe peak oil isn't the debate that we're going to have as much because we we become more efficient in terms of ways that we can get carbon out of the ground by being more resourceful and drilling deeper and, and cracking the rock and steaming it out of there. All these different techniques, we're becoming more efficient at it. But it, instead of peak oil becoming that the point that we have to be concerned about, it might be peak carbon. So what do we do as we go above 400 parts per million? And how is that... Ocean acidification, atmospheric CO2, and glacial recession, those are the three undeniable ways that we can measure our anthropogenic impact on climate. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Cowspiracy yet? Cowspiracy? Cowspiracy. It's a documentary. Oh, Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy. Oh, I'm familiar. I haven't seen it, but it's about the methane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I think I got a DVD in my car. I'll give it to you. But so. it basically is looking, it's looking at that very issue through the prism of the impact of animal agriculture yeah. on the environment and, 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 and really evaluating, you know, the extent to which that's kind of the elephant in the room that no one's talking about. Yeah. But it, it really is having a devastating impact on, on everything from, you know, desertification, rainforest destruction, ocean pollution, you know, you name it, <clears throat> carbon emissions yeah. through the roof, all those sorts of things. But yeah. I think you'd be interested in checking it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh yeah, and thanks to you for inspiring a healthier lifestyle. So well, <laughs> since I've gotten you. to know you, I've, <laughs> I've, I've changed my, uh, you know, that's a cool thing. Oh, uh, cool, man. My, that's my good to hear. Too. Thank you. But, uh, I mean, you're the, you're, you know, you're quite the inspirational figure, and, and um, I hope that you uh, continue doing what you do. Uh, I think you inspire a lot of people, and your message is very powerful. And so I, I think the way to close it down is just to, um, maybe have you share a few words um, for somebody who's out there who perhaps is yearning for a little bit more adventure or outdoors in their life, but they're stuck. You know, they're sitting in their cubicle, they're at work right now listening to this, wishing they were outdoors. But, you know, the, that person who just has trouble taking that first step. Yeah. Well, wherever you are, um, probably in North America where you're listening to this, or if you're in Europe or pretty much anywhere, there is some degree of nature close by. Um, you can always find a place that has trees and plants and things that are that the random beauty of nature. And so we're so, you're in a cubicle, you're in this human right angle construct. There's plastic, there's steel, there's concrete, and it's even like the tablecloth here has right angles and it's, everything is built into that. And when you go outdoors and you go for a run on the trail, even the trail and the dirt on it is, is it's chaos. It's random. And then there's the trees and all that. And that's knowing that that wilderness, this might not be wilderness, but that nature is there, can rejuvenate your soul and, mm -hmm. and make you happy. So um, start out by going for a walk, go for a run, check out the climbing gym, because that'll it help you understand what climbing is. Mm -hmm. Go visit a cliff. Um, but... Um, don't fall off the cliff. Though. Don't fall off the cliff, but challenge yourself. But yeah, instead of um, instead of doing something that you've always done, do something that uh, challenges yourself, and let, let that uh, uh, that that fear of that that grip of anxiety in your stomach saying, "I can't do this." Let that be your motivator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as you say, be good, be kind, and, and be happy. Be happy, <laughs> right? Yeah, a little. That's my like. Like that's your mantra. Yeah, so I, I I like to share it with people. So because 
um, goodness leads to kindness, and kindness plus goodness equals happiness. So, but it's nothing I created. I mean, it's out there. That's there's people that are um, that are there. So, <laughs> thank Good, you, man. Rich. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, man. This is a joy and a pleasure and an honor. It was really great to talk to you. Uh, you inspire me every day, and um, I love following your journey online as it continues to unfold. And I'm really excited for everybody to see this movie and learn more about not just climbing, but but your life and, and kind of um, have that own dialogue with themselves about challenging themselves. So it's going to be cool, man. You're in for a good ride when this movie comes out, I think. It's going to be cool. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, if you're digging on, on Conrad, the best place to check him out, conradanchor.com. And his Instagram feed is epic. It's at Conrad underscore anchor, right? Anywhere else to check you out? Yeah. Um, those are, yeah. That's the main thing, right? Yeah. There's Facebook and, and those things. But right. um, yeah, they're, um, Instagram's a great community. Yeah. Pictures. And yeah, your feed's stuff. amazing. I love it. So cool. All right, man. Well, uh, come back and talk to me again. We'll talk Will soon. Will you do that? Yeah. All right, bet. man. Thanks so much. Peace. Plants. Yeah.